God is good, and all the time, God is good. Our first lesson is from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. From Mark chapter 1, beginning verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and then the Sabbath came. He entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And all were amazed. And they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever wondered if the walls of this church could talk? What would they say? I mean, would they, what would their testimony be? Would they speak of lives being transformed? Would they, they speak of babies growing up and the fear and admonition of the Lord? If these walls could speak, would they speak of young people coming of age and, and spiritually no longer walking on the coattails of their parents or grandparents, but actually receiving for themselves the message and the call of Christ upon their lives? If these walls could speak, would they speak of great celebrations? Would they, would they speak of revivals, missions conferences, marriages, baptisms? Would they speak of lives that were touched like they had never been touched before? Would they speak of great laughter? Or would they speak of great tears? What, could these, what would these walls say if they could speak? When I read Psalm 111, I begin to ask myself if these walls could speak. Would they, would they say to us who have worshipped here, I will give thanks to the Lord of my whole heart and the company of the upright and the congregation? And great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. If these walls could speak, would they say what the psalmist encapsulated in his in this psalm? You know, if these walls could speak, would they speak of lives that were brought back from the edge of destruction? Would they, would they speak of hearts? like John Wesley, were strangely stirred and claimed for the rest of their lives to be gods. You know, a blind man on a fast horse would be able to see very easily. You know, even though he couldn't see, he could feel. America's changing. It's changing fast. 
According to the last statistics that I read, this is from the Natural Church Development uh, Program, and I don't think it's changed since then. There's not one county in the entire United States of America, not in the continental U.S., that is actually growing percentage-wise as much as the population has. If these walls of every congregation, of every church in America could speak, would they testify the church is no longer the center, no longer the center point of our society? You know, it's sad when you think about it because Jesus spent how much of his life in ministry in the synagogues of his day? I mean, he was always there. He was always in attendance. He was always teaching. He was always instructing on the ways of our Father God. And of course, if those synagogue walls in Capernaum could speak, it would be kind of hard today because there's not one stone left upon another. But if they could speak, they'd have a lot to say. They, they could have told our hearts of those that worshipped there, how they burned with passion when Jesus spoke, when the Lord was doing great things in their midst. You know, as a carpenter, Jesus really had no positional authority in that community. His authority instead came from the wisdom and knowledge, as well as his competence, in interpreting God's holy word. Even as a boy, Jesus wowed the temple, you know, authorities, and the people with his wisdom and his grasp of scripture. I mean, they were impressed. And they were the teachers of the law. All they knew is that they never heard an individual teach as Jesus taught. And they said to one another, He teaches as one who has authority. Not as the teachers of the law. The teachers of the law, they would quote great rabbis that had spoken before them. You know, that's really the great thing about the church. You don't really need a seminary degree even a college degree, even a high school diploma for that matter, to teach a Sunday school. What you need is a passion as well as a connection with God. And if you're serious about seeking Him, and you, you can know the Lord's going to do the rest. Now, some of the greatest ministers of all time, seriously, they're still in diapers. I mean, some of them can't even put together a real sentence yet. But when it comes to reve revealing the ways of the Lord, uh, that message comes through loud and clear. The Lord our God is the author of all life. And th this is why it it's so imperative to seek Jesus together as the body of Christ. Because what one may be lacking, someone can come alongside and they can bring more light. When the writer, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, beginning verse 23, he says this, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, America, we're sort of like that proverbial frog getting warmed up in the frying pan. And we're dying so slowly we don't even know it. Now the simple truth is bad things happen all the time. This is nothing new. To weather the storms of life around us as well as you know, physical as well as spiritual storms, we need to band together as the church and find our strength in real numbers. Just as a threefold cord is not easily broken, neither is a church that's united in Christ Jesus. You know, if these walls could speak, how many fierce campaigns of the enemy coming up short would be spoken of? Since the days these walls first stood? How many prodigal sons, how many prodigal daughters have come home? And how many marriages have been restored? And how many of the lost 
have been found. Now, if you think that the walls of that synagogue in, in Capernaum would speak of great spiritual battles that the walls here can't speak of, you'd be mistaken. I mean, something awesome, something really amazing happens when God's people humble themselves and begin seeking God. Today, with you know, our sophisticated knowledge of medicine, we don't often speak of those who are possessed by, by demons. That's not to say that the power of the darkness isn't working as actively today as it was in these days that were told about in Mark's Gospel. In Mark's Gospel, a man with an unclean spirit, when confronted with Jesus, he bursts out in agony. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Oh, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and come out of him with a shriek. And the people were so amazed, they said to each other, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits. And they obey him. And then Mark tells us news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. You know, no matter how many times I read this passage, I really can find no indication whatsoever that the walls actually spoke. But what you do read in this passage is that the people, once they were touched by God's presence, they could not keep still. They couldn't keep silent about what they'd seen and what they'd experienced. They just had to tell somebody, anybody, what the Lord had done and was doing in their lives. And I strongly suspect our walls aren't going to let go and, and they're not going to go out and start sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and what God is doing in our lives. That sharing and that loving, that's our task. Only it's not a task, it's really an opportunity to come alongside those that haven't seen, haven't heard what we've seen and what we've heard. Now the church in America has been silent far too long. We're we're still the voice of our generation, as well as for every generation. Instead of expecting the hurt and the loss to come to us and hear you know, these walls speak, we need to simply be ourselves and let God take care of the rest in us and through us. You know, I promise you, as we all begin letting go and letting God have actually more access to our lives, instead of saying, God, you know, you, you just stay over here. But no. Welcome, welcoming him in. We're going to discover we've got a whole lot more to say than we ever are going to be able to possibly even say. You know, being the best witness in this world, it's not about being perfect in speech or being flawless in our speech. It's about being forgiven. And it's about being grateful enough to simply go out and tell another beggar where we found the bread. In closing, I'd like to share something that I read in the book. I thought it was pretty provocative. You know, Socrates, that, that smart Greek guy, he only taught for 40 years. Plato, a little bit longer, 50. Aristotle for 40. Jesus, three and a half years. Yet the influence of Christ's ministry, it, it infinitely, you know, transcends the impact left by all of these learned, uh, you know, the world's greatest philosophers. Jesus didn't paint any pictures, yet some of the finest, you know, painters, artists such as Raphael and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, they all received their inspiration from him. Jesus didn't write any poetry, but scores of the greatest poets, you know, were inspired by him. Jesus didn't compose any, any music. Still Handel, Beethoven, Bach, Mendelssohn, they all reached their highest perfection, you know, making music that was composed in the praise of Jesus Christ. Every spear of greatness, every spear of human greatness has been enriched 
by this humble carpenter of Nazareth. If walls could speak, they'd tell of all of these things and a great many more. But notice who actually has the final word. It was a Roman centurion who's stationed at the foot of the cross and he watches our Lord die and he sums it up for us all. Surely this man was the Son of God. Well, as the church of this age, as well as the church of any ages, might we be able to say, yes, he is, and yes, he was. And yes, he is infinitely even more the Lord of my life. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, if these walls could speak, they'd probably make greater sound than many of your servants. Lord, help us to be able to find our voice. Help us to be able to let go all of our fears and let the truth be known. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.